we're not, we want to turn attention up north uh, right now because residents in Boko are at risk of losing essential services as business businesses close shop to avoid being caught in conflict amid rising tensions there. Let's get into that right now. Tonight, essential service providers are steadily abandoning Boko in the Upper East Region, ADB. The loan banking service or bank offering uh, services to the community for the past year has now closed shop. ADB's exit of the highly tense area comes only days after the Chief Justice shut down judicial services there. Our correspondents report the nearest bank for residents could be at least two hours away. Tonight, ADB, in its farewell message to customers, referred to them to transact business using their online platforms. But also tonight, residents in Boko or in, Boko, in the Boko area are grappling with water shortage after staff of the Ghana Water Company also exited the area. Communities affected the most include those in North and South Natinga, Patelmi, Sabunzongo, and uh you know and the likes now some of the residents have been speaking to tv3 let's take a listen to them as they recount how difficult life is without water indeed you could hear some of these residents explain to us uh, you know how difficult life has been for them without water with all these essential services uh, leaving or exiting their communities because of the conflict there I want us to take a listen to those and then we'll speak to our correspondent. The, light, the type is not flowing, the water is not coming. We are fetching all water, the water too is no good. Well, uh, that truncates it earlier than I thought, but we'll fix that problem and bring you more later. But all these service providers have one common concern the state of security. Let's check the pulse of the area now. Castro Senyala is reporter on the ground. Castro, 6 to 6 p.m. curfew on the communities. I can imagine that there's a semblance of calm tonight. Is that the case? Right, uh, Kamini, you are right. Um, there's a bit of uh, calm and serenity in the Boko Township. I just uh, returned from somewhere closer where I usually go to monitor uh, the happenings in Boko. And I can report that calm is... Uh, there, the security agencies made up of the military and the police are also on the ground uh, with increased efforts as far as patrolling and responding to distress calls is concerned. Mm. I see. Beneath that calm, uh, we know that uh, there are those rising tensions community to community, which is why these companies are exiting. Now, tell us a bit more about these companies who are exiting and how it's impacting lives there. Right, Kamini, you see, most of these companies have people uh, living and working there from all over the place, uh, irrespective of uh, the tribes or whatsoever. And so when tensions uh, are heightened and uh, the fights begin, it becomes a very uh, volatile area for uh, some of these people. And then also, if you take the case of the Ghana Water Company Limited Workers, for instance, even though they are an essential service provider, workers would sometimes have to go to certain areas, most of the, play, most of the time, uh, major suburbs where the fights are ongoing and they have valves they need to shut or open. And when instances like that happen, they are left with no other option than uh, to protect them, themselves against, I mean, these uh, fights, I mean, fights where they can go because if they do, their lives would be at stake. Also, we have companies like uh, ADB, which has also just announced that they are exiting the area temporarily because of the security situation. Uh, some of these uh, facilities or, or companies are cited in areas where the fights are intense. And, you know, sometimes they shoot, the gunshot or the gunfire is sporadic, such like that uh, you can't I mean, tell whether you are safe or not. The best is to uh, get to a safer place where you know that they, I mean, you won't be caught up in the fight. And so these are some of the concerns of these workers uh, in the area. And for them, the best is to evacuate as early as possible. We also understand that uh, some people who are even not workers, uh, but are going are traders or going about duties on the, I mean, trading activities in the market are also uh, left with no other choice but to evacuate for safety reasons. And so it's not only with companies uh, or bigger companies, but also individuals who are beginning to feel threatened because 
the security situation there is worsening by the day. Even mm. though security agencies are doing the best, but it appears that so much needs to be done. Listen, Kasha, on the subject of water, I know you've been sniffing around local authorities. What have they been telling you about alternatives for people in these communities? Kemini, uh, local authorities are very careful to speak on the issues of Boko because they are very dicey. Uh, you might say something and then you inflame tensions. And so for that matter, they would always confine in us and not speak publicly. But uh, local authorities say they are doing their best because it's worrisome that uh, residents have had to resort to or save water sources to be able to uh, live by the day. You can imagine five days going to a week without water. Some residents who I continue to speak with and engage tell me that they uh, have had to resort to uh, fetching water from ponds and wells that had been abandoned because they had uh, safe sources of water. And now that uh, the situation is persistent, they've had to return to these what, I mean, sources of water, which is very worrying. They can't do much with that in terms of cooking, washing, cleaning, and even drinking. And so it's a problem. Now, I've been speaking to authorities, like I stated, who wouldn't want to speak because it's very dicey. But they tell me that they are responding uh, to uh, the distress calls for uh, the availability, for water to be right. available for these people. And we are continuing to engage in them. I see. Castro, uh, just hang on for me. I want to bring in Dr. Victor Doke who is a, a security a consultant and a lecturer at the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training Center. Doc, good evening to you. I'm going to put you on the back burner just for a tad while I finish with our correspondent, but thank you so much for joining us here tonight. Castro, listen, you. when we zoom out and we'll look at the issues, one of the things we'll be concerned with outside of the immediate security and, and concerns of residents will be the constituencies within that area. I want to show that to our viewers now so we see the number of constituencies that could be affected if we zoom out and look at the bigger picture of whether or not these people could be disenfranchised. We have Binduri, Pusiga, Boko Central, Zebula, Bongo, and we know there are excesses overflowing into Boga. So there is Bogatanga Central, Boga East, Bosa North and South, Shianapaga, and Garu. These areas are also likely to be caught in the situation in the Boko uh, area at the moment. But I want to talk to you about this situation because then there are those who are also very concerned about the political underlinings there. What do residents tell you, really? Uh, Kevin, the fears of residents as far as uh, voting is concerned is that they don't want the situation to reach a level where a state of emergency be called in the area and that would mean disenfranchising them when it comes to the elections on december 7th uh, they are uh, concerned that if this fight continue to persist uh, government and uh, i mean especially will not have any option than to uh, declare a state of emergency and that would mean they would be able to choose leaders for the next uh, big government which is very much of a concern but in all they are i mean hopeful that very soon uh, the state with, it, with its actors, such as the military and the, the police and other state security agencies, will, able, will be able to quickly uh, bring this conflict to a closure by engaging the feuding factions to find a list of solutions to the problem. Kasher, we'll leave it here. Thank you so much for joining us. We can now bring in again uh, Dr. Victor Dr. Docker, uh, security consultant. Doc, good evening to you. Uh, and thank you once Hello. again for, indeed, thank you once again for joining us here on Ghana tonight. Uh, we, we're seeing some of these essential services packing bags and leaving. No more response to a situation like this? Well, thank you very much. I think uh, in a normal situation like this, you would obviously have um, people or services, institutions, um, fearing for the lives of, of the workers and even their own lives. But in this situation, with this kind of emergency situation we have in Boko, it is not right. But I would say the services, essential services like water, they should take a second look at the situation on, on pulling out because water is an essential commodity. Now, take for instance, you have even a refugee camp that we know how, how essential water is with regards to, you know, persons of concern, let alone you have an area, okay, vast like Boko, where people are going to rely on water for farming, 
for domestic use and other services, even in the hospitals, what if there is an outbreak of a disease? What then happens? So I think they should take a second look at it. With regards to billing and all that, as I heard earlier on in the discussion, I think the billing and all that can be done easily with regards to just giving them a quota as they've been paid in the, in the past or whatever. Reading the meters for fear of life, I don't think it's, it's, it's necessary now. They can just give them the quota mm -hmm. to be paying every month. But I think water is essential. The people Indeed. need the water. But byproducts of situations like this are, you know, what we see. Essential services attempting to leave this community for their own safety. Would expect the government of the day then to be able to reach out to the people and help them, you know, the best way possible. What, what, what are the expectations you have of government and the security agencies now that we know there is, you know, water shortage in certain areas? Yeah, so now this, this incident, the aftermath of uh, Mr. Seidu entering into Boko, the consequences we've seen, services closing up, all of this tells us, okay, when you analyze it clearly, that there is, there is a big challenge with regards to how government or central government is handling the issue, either through the chieftaincy ministry, through the National Peace Council or the security services. There is what I call the lack of contingency plan, an emergency plan with regards to solving the immediate issue, which is how do we bring some relative peace there with regards to the said gentleman in there right now. So government is aware. When I heard the Chief Tessie Minister speaking, he made mention for the fact that a said gentleman in there would mean that there would be peace because Kusasis will not agree with regards to the said gentleman being there. And now, how do you even go to convince a said gentleman to come out of Boko? Okay, it will take another step or process, right? So now what the government needs to do is to come out clearly, okay? Through the Chief Tenancy Ministry or the National Peace Council, let's have a roadmap. First of all, how do we convince the said city that his presence in Boko means no end to violence? That is the first step then you can now continue from where you left off with regards to resolution aspects or even addressing the conflict itself. Other than that, we'll be running in circles. Mm -hmm. but let, let's not forget the resources that are being spent for these security services in there, the amount of money that is being spent on them for the peacekeeping aspect and all that, it is very boring. Mm. So I think I plead... The, the, the state institutions, the heads, should rally around, get to the table, get the essential stakeholders involved, and then call this said gentleman and let him know his presence there would mean there was, there's, there's not going to be an end to the chaos that we are experiencing. And if, we, if we want to address a, want to address what actually is a problem, then we should start with that. Mm. You know, at the moment, we know that there is a six to six curfew there. Uh, from where you sit, for how long do you think this would work? Yeah, so Kimani, the, the issue is, you see, from when have we heard about curfews being imposed, the issues about deployment and all of that. You see, we see this mechanism as sort of the only way that the central government is comfortable with. Yes, it is essential that when you have clashes, you're sending the troops, okay, in there, and then to care of the clashes. But this in itself is only a direct prevention measure. It is supposed to address the immediate, okay, eminent, you know, crisis, which, is, which has been done. Now, when you're talking about the other structural preventive mechanisms, you're supposed to be engaging, so saying engagement with the two sides, okay? Either through eminent people or what about the 
inter-ethnic peace committee that has been established. Okay, we are not talking about it. I don't know whether it, it's still active or not. That committee was set up specifically to look at this specific issue. Okay, they have members from both sides. They have CSO's builder, who is a peace building facilitator, okay, who liaises with the committee, the government, National Peace Council, and all stakeholders that are relevant to this particular issue. So with curfews, yes, it's only just temporal. But the core issue with regards to the chieftaincy, with regards to the Mapusis agreeing that, with regards to the chieftaincy, if there is any issue, there is a process. You can channel it through the litigation, and then you can talk about the others. But the curfew itself doesn't resolve a conflict such as this. Mm, I see. Uh, once again, I want to you know zo zoom out of this just a little bit. For those who have questioned the timing of the um, resurrection of this conflict in, in Boko, uh, one of the secondary collateral concerns they have had is the possible disenfranchisement of people there. The security, the, the electoral commission will find itself in a very tricky situation if the next uh, 34 or so days, um, you know, there isn't a concrete plan to be able to figure out what to do uh, for the people in, th in that area and its, envir in its environs. What are you seeing from a security perspective uh, around the elections there? Well, it's two things. Number one, now, you talk about essential services withdrawing. Now, what about the EC officials also, right? They would also fear for their lives, hence wouldn't like to, you know, put themselves on the, in, the, in the front line like that. Now, even if, let's, let's see the scenario, even if you deploy as much as you want, the truth, okay, to foresee that there's peace on election day, you're talking about these two ethnic groups and other ethnic groups coming out, right, on that voting that you would have them queue in one line, ballot, I mean, go through the process and then cast their ballot. Now, are you going to ask them to go home after casting their ballot? Okay, thereby it raises questions about transparency and all that. Yes, you can have casting agents, but by and large, we know the custom that has come with regards to elections. You cast your ballot and then people wait to see the counting and all of that. Now, you could have a system where you deploy, you give the people the opportunity to cast their ballot, and then you ask them to go back for fear that maybe declarations of results may cause another crisis. So you have to synthesize them on that for them to understand. The only core essential party agents will be there. The other scenario, what I see is one, we get a said gentleman out of Boko. We explain to him, these are the reasons why we want you to just step aside for a moment. Let's have the elections so that people will not be disenfranchised. Okay, we look at that. Other than that, then what I see is that one, when we, we, are, near, we, we are nearing the D-Day itself, it will be difficult. And that is why I mentioned that what is the contingency plan, which includes all of this? How do we ensure, how does the EC ensure that the people in Boko cast their ballots? And we all know the perception surrounding the two ethnic groups. It is perceived the Kusasi are aligned to the NDC, it is perceived the Mapusis are aligned to the NDP. So who benefits and who loses? And this is a this, this tough situation that we find ourselves in as a country, as institutions. So and, 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 the way forward. And indeed, you know, considering how people can be impassioned about their political alignment, this could even exactly. inflate the conflict a bit more, couldn't it? Exactly. Now, in, in the history past with regards to the conflict, we've had, you know, violent clashes because of the elections. I think in 2000 or so, there are about if I may be right. Now, these clashes stem the course of declaration of results. Okay, so
So you can have a repetition. Whereby now the dynamics of politics has changed. Especially when you have the linkage between politics and chieftaincy, which is very, 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 very serious. So we have a serious crisis on our hands. Not just security, we are talking about humanitarian crisis, apart from security, mm -hmm. and then political crisis. Mm -hmm. So the honors now lies on the state institutions, the EC security services, central government, to come together and then put out a very comprehensive contingency plan. So we can see the people in Boko, you know, voting on that set day without any kind of, you know, problems. It will be tough and be challenging, but I think if we are able to come up with a good you know, contingency plan, we'll be able to surmount. Indeed. The, and, the and, you know, and history tells us that we haven't really pulled our weight when it comes to dealing with the humanitarian crisis aspect of the conflict that has plagued Boko uh, for, for a very long time. But... Look at this. We have uh, what appears to be a lack of contingency, an emergency response plan. Uh, we have the similar intentions on one hand. We also, ha you know, we are now faced with what appears to be a retrogression, retrogression of all the progress that has been made in dealing with the conflict uh, in Boko. Listen, if we put all of these to together, we seem to have a keg of gunpowder, uh, pun unintended, to go off. What could we be up against if the situation situation persists? If the situation persists, trust me, then you're going to have a prolonged conflict associated with armed violence, associated with more casualties and deaths, which state institutions and the central government will not have any solution to. And what will happen is that the town will be isolated. There will be no services there. Okay? Essential services will pull out eventually. Everything will be standstill for the people there. Mm. You will have mass migration of people from that area into the urban center. And what happens then? Okay, we are talking about, you know, pressure on already less or scarce resources that we are having here. And that also brings conflict in itself. Very so well. the town will be deserted. Mm -hmm. Nothing will go on until we look at what others, including myself, have proposed with regards to Indeed. the gentleman they do and then the process itself. Absolutely. Indeed. Hopefully, uh, you know, this is solved, uh, you know, quicker and in, in a better way. Thank you so much for talking to us. Uh, Dr. Victor Doke is a security analyst. He's also a lecturer, consultant, excuse me. He's also a lecturer at the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping and Training Center. We've been talking about Boko.